Good morning and thank you so much for tuning in to us today at the Bio Buzz Center straight from the Bio International Convention in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm Karen Batra. I am Director of Communications for Food and Agriculture with Bio and I am here with my esteemed colleagues. To my right is Dr. Kathy Enright. She is our Executive Vice President for Food and Agriculture at Bio. And to my left is Richard Lobb. He is our Managing Director for the Council for Biotech Information. What we're going to do today is just kind of do a little wrap up about some of the top issues that we've had uh, in the topic of our discussions this week and talk about what some of those outcomes might be. Uh, Kathy, you have uh, been here for almost a week now. Tell me, I, what are some of the takeaways from this conference for you? I think the uh, biggest takeaway for me is the level of uh, energy and dedication to innovation and safety. Uh, just to be on the floor here at the convention and also to attend some of the sessions. This technology is going to rock our world. And I have just been, I uh, it never, I'm never, uh, ceases to amaze me of what, of how inventive and uh, dedicated and caring this industry is. Definitely agriculture is one of the greatest of American industries. Dick, you and I have been working in agriculture for a little while now on communications issues. Uh, we're starting to see, I think, uh, uh, some increased spotlight on mainstream agriculture production, especially modern agriculture production. What do you think are some of the challenges being faced by the agricultural community in the United States today? Well, I think we're facing the, the challenge of increasing production without having any uh, bad effect on the environment and I think the important thing is that biotechnology is absolutely critical to that function because if you use biotech seeds there are many uh, aspects of it that help you manage your environmental impact in a much more favorable and positive manner. So I think the biotech is actually a, uh, a solution to that ongoing challenge of, of the footprint that modern production agriculture has on the environment. Uh, definitely, I would agree with that too. You know, you can join in this conversation and submit some questions to our panel if you'd like. We're on Twitter at I Am Biotech, so don't be afraid to engage in that conversation. Kathy, I think that a major theme that has come out of the sessions and meetings this week has been a need for increased support from a regulatory agencies and uh, just kind of more def defense of the industry and of the technology. Uh, what do you think about that? I think the, uh, certainly uh, we've had uh, challenges with the regulatory community. Uh, we've had 20 years now of experience with biotech and we seem to, um, uh, the information, the tests, the studies uh, that are required to put a, uh, per, a, a development into commercialization is increasing even though our knowledge, our experience, impact studies uh, demonstrate that we know more now than, than we've ever known about the safety and the, um, and the uh, commercial impact of these technologies. So I think with regard for, to regulatory systems and from our, uh, from our regulatory communities, I think we need not so much care in a defense of the technology, but a defense of their processes. FDA, EPA, USDA, they really understand and uh, they understand this technology. If there were concerns that were credible, we've heard a lot about that uh, lately, um, they would act on those concerns. The fact is, is that uh, they, they're a little quiet uh, to our liking when stories come out, studies that have been debunked are used over and over and again by some of, some of the, pro the proponents of, um, of uh, other production methods. I, I would welcome from them a defense of their process. And let me ask you this, Kathy, do you think that there need to be any changes or modifications made to that process? Uh, I think, uh, yes, definitely we need to have, it needs to be more predictable, more uh, for all. Uh, transparency is, is fantastic. The coverage needs to be looked at. We certainly shouldn't be regulating something uh, disproportional to the, the perceived risk uh, that's intended. Uh, to that end, though, I think that uh, certainly uh, Secretary Vilsack uh, and the President in the release of the Bioeconomy Blueprint is saying the right things, is moving to a, a more efficient risk-based system. And so I just look forward to the implementation of both of their promises. 
I would definitely agree with that. Certainly a big challenge that we face in the agricultural biotechnology sector is a lack of understanding about the technology. Uh, Dick, since in your role in, in communicating about agriculture, what do you think is a key takeaway that consumers and policymakers alike should know about biotechnology? Well, we had some very good news this week from the American Medical Association, which several years ago affirmed the safety of biotech crops, and they came out with that again uh, this week, very firmly stating that there's absolutely no health risk whatsoever from using biotech food ingredients in food products. And indeed, this is very pervasive because the vast majority of corn, soybeans, sugar beets, and some other crops are uh, biotech in nature, and, the, and these go into the food supply. So AMA looked at this and reaffirmed its support of the safety of uh, biotech ingredients and also take, took a very firm stand that there is no need for any specific labeling on food products stating that the ingredients are from biotech crops. Uh, that would just confuse the public because actually there's, there's just no difference at all in terms of the food or nutritional qualities between biotech and conventional crops. And certainly what Dick was referring to was a decision that was made by the American Medical Association in their annual meeting in Chicago this week. Um, I think that we would be remiss if we didn't segue the conversation to talk about the issue of biotech food labeling. Uh, we've seen some increased debate in the media and the public arena on this issue. Kathy, why do you think that is? Well, I think what we're looking at is uh, a change in the, the ask by uh, some folks who are not in favor of the technology and perhaps some consumers, some level of consumers. And, and they're asking the question, we want the right to know, mm -hmm. right? So with regard, to, uh, with regard to that question, I can tell you that the biotechnology uh, companies, members of the Food and Ag section of Bio, support this technology. We're for, we're, we want folks to be aware of biotech. We are quite transparent and we're happy to increase that transparency if need be. Uh, so we think that with regard to the an ask of right to know, we're moving in a direction. But labeling isn't the answer to right to know. As you well know, uh, the, the government is very uh, clear about what information should is appropriate, uh, should be on packages, and what, what is inappropriate to be on, on food labeling. So rather than, than segue from right to no to labeling, I think it's a different dialogue. I think the right to know com can come in a very different form than labeling. So what can we do? We can address both issues, right? We can maintain the integrity of food labeling as it stands now so that folks actually can get information that's, that's um, uh, worthwhile, that means something to them on food packages, and talk to folks and increase the awareness about biotechnology. Definitely increasing awareness is going to be key. Uh, I know that a poignant moment for me during this week's sessions was uh, when Greg Jaffe, who works for Center for Science and the Public Interest, one of the more credible consumer groups in Washington, D.C., was asked the question for his position on mandatory labeling of biotech foods. And Dr. Jaffe said uh, that consumer right to know does not justify mandatory labeling. Uh, and I think that this is a, a right to know issue and certainly something that is top of mind with California voters as they look at the referendum that's going to be on the ballot this fall. Uh, Dick, I know that the Council for Biotechnology Information is heavily involved in the coalition to educate people on that issue. Uh, going forward, what is CBI and the coalition going to do to educate California consumers on this issue? Well, we are part of a coalition in California of uh, agricultural groups, uh, food groups, and many others, environmental groups, uh, uh, voter groups, that are concerned about the labeling initiative and are will be working to educate the, the public uh, about the fact that this type of labeling really wouldn't tell people anything that they don't uh, already know because there is no functional difference, there's no nutritional difference, there's no difference in how the food uh, behaves and how it is uh, treated by the human body uh, between conventional and, and biotech. So uh, we have a, a wonderful group of people out in California that we're working with to try to reach out to the voters of California. How all that's going to turn out, you know, uh, is uh, we're working on that right now. But we do expect to do a good job of reaching out to people and just letting them know the, the, the facts. And I think hopefully people will respond to the facts appropriately and uh, reject this because this is just a label that, that nobody really needs on their food products. 
And certainly you have a, a large coalition of like-minded organizations that are joining in that support. Can you talk a little bit about some of the other farm groups and maybe the farmer's perspective on this issue? Well, the uh, Farm Bureau and, and allied groups like that are certainly uh, with us on this issue. And the important thing for, for farmers is that biotech crops uh, give them a, a lot of advantages in that they can do a better job of controlling uh, insect pests without the use of uh, uh, pesticides or a very minimal use of pesticides and also allows them to use more uh, environmentally benign uh, weed killers to control weeds in their fields and uh, enables them to avoid uh, what is called uh, tillage, which is when you actually turn over the soil to bury and key, uh, kill the weeds. You don't have to do that. And the less you disturb the soil, the better that is uh, for the ground because you, less, you lose less soil to uh, either erosion or by uh, water or by wind. So this is a, a very environmentally uh, benign and very helpful sort of technology. The farmers really like it. They have adopted uh, biotechnology uh, very much across the board. Uh, approximately 90% on average of the row crops, including corn, soybeans, cotton, and sugar beets are biotech at this point. So it has really uh, taken over the marketplace as far as the agricultural community is concerned. And we just want to address the concerns that consumers might have so that we get uh, complete acceptance on that side as well. And certainly a nice summary of some of the current benefits of biotechnology and why farmers have adopted this technology uh, around the world. Uh, Kathy, you are a uh, scientist by training, so this is a nice time to segue to a uh, discussion around the future benefits of biotechnology. What are some of those traits that are in the pipeline uh, that we have the opportunity to look forward in the future? Well, uh, for the U.S. consumer, healthier oils are coming high oleic, omega-3 enhanced oils, a, a reduced uh, acrylamide potato. Um, as you know, uh, uh, acrylamide is throughout our diet and uh, folks eat a lot of French fries. And so uh, one, one company is working to provide a food safety uh, benefit. In addition, uh, uh, additional food safety benefits it would include uh, no, uh, the removal of allergens, uh, from food, uh, and uh, with regard to across the across the globe, we're seeing micronutrient uh, efforts in uh, roots, uh, roots, roots, cassava, beans, uh, so that folks can truly get from their their garden or their or their field a whole food. Right um, um, there, it's much uh, much easier to deliver vitamins and nutrients in a food than in a pill. Right, much less, uh, much much more uh, efficacious. Um, in addition, we are hoping to see the first uh, genetically engineered animal. Hmm? Uh, there's a lot of uh, we've been waiting a long time to to see genetically engineered salmon come on to the U.S. market. Um, my hope is that the uh, the regulatory the regulators will be able to uh, feel confident in their process and get that approved as quickly as possible. We've had a, some great discussion about crop biotech up to this point, but it is nice that you brought up the Aqua Advantage salmon that's been pending uh, action by the Food and Drug Administration for some years now. Kathy, the uh, lull in action on that application is beginning to have a chilling effect on the animal biotech sector. Do you think that uh, the uh, possibility of that sector to actually move offshore is a, a real threat to the biotechnology sector? Uh, certainly it is, and it goes back to what we were talking about, Karen, a few minutes ago, about the need for the regulatory system to operate in a predictable way, right, With in the absence of political interference. Uh, we know that there are a number of uh, biotech uh, animals in development, right, or um, and we, uh, or who have that have been created, but are not going to be commercialized because the regulatory hurdle, the expense of the regulatory hurdle, is so enormous, and the uncertainty of of, um, of investing in the technology, therefore, is also uncertain. So, absolutely, I think with regard to um, any innovative. Um, uh, technology, if the homegrown regulatory system uh, becomes an impediment, then those innovations will move offshore. And uh, we're talking about uh, animal biotechnology used for food, 
and the development of food, but I think it's also important to point out that a lot of animal biotechnologies are being developed for the healthcare sector and for use in pharmaceutical development. Talk a little bit about that side. Certainly, absolutely. They're um, in, um, in milk. Um, uh, there is, uh, the, there is um, uh, drugs are for human use mm -hmm. um, and animal use are being developed. Uh, and I think that, you know, it's, it's quite interesting, Karen, you, you asked that question because with regard to the health sector, Americans, um, uh, associations, interest groups have accepted that technology. Uh, it's still the same technology. Recombinant DNA technology is recombinant DNA technology, whether you are using it in animals to create drugs or in the laboratory to create drugs. But with regards to food, we just haven't, we're not there yet. So we're hoping that um, with the, with the um, emergence of these consu obviously consumer-friendly uh, foods entering the market, healthful meats, healthful uh, oils, mm -hmm. uh, safer uh, safer food products uh, that, have, that have, will come to the market eventually uh, based on biotechnology innovation that, that consumers will have a much better understanding of what this technology holds, uh, holds for them, for their safety, for their environment as Dick was talking about, uh, and for their, their quality of life in general. Certainly a wonderful point to end our discussion on uh, the many promises of agricultural biotechnology, both in uh, healthcare applications as well as food applications. Um, be sure and, and join in the, in the chat and, and catch up on all of the action and the news that you've missed at BioConvention this week on uh, Twitter at I Am Biotech. And this is Karen Batra signing off from Boston.